Hello, Foreign and Technomets viewers. Uh, I am, as you know, uh, Dr. Rob Farley from the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. With me today is uh, Dr. Nick Clark. Nick, uh, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I, I am an assistant professor of political science at Susquehanna University, uh, and my research and teaching primarily focuses on the European Union. My research really uh, is, is focused on political behavior, on voting and, and public opinion within Europe. Right. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about um, you know, whether there are two, three, four, or five crises of uh, the European Union at the moment, but we're going to go through a few of them with an eye towards um, how these crises are being structured by, but also potentially affecting the institutions, the legitimacy, the foundations of the European Union. And so we're, we're going to draw out some, hopefully, some small bore, but maybe even some larger um, uh, ideas about uh, what the European Union is right now and the direction that it's going. So um, what I want to start with is Greece. So Greece is sort of moving out of the headlines, both in terms of what people are thinking about right now, but also in terms of uh, how relevant it, relevant it is for the survival of the EU. Um, but I guess from your point of view, where are we with respect to Greece's place in the EU at the moment? You know, what's been happening over the past few months and how relevant was the crisis for in the broader picture of um, sort of European Union legitimacy and, and politics? Um, I think it has ongoing relevancy for legitimacy. I think in terms of politics, in terms of talking about the evolution of the institutions, it's, it's also not a done story because mm. um, while the sort of reforms that have been discussed, at least in part in response to what's going, going on to Greece, have been put on the back burner a little, I think, at least by the media, if not by political actors there. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that's going to come up again. Uh, and that may be due to uh, uh, events in Greece sort of replaying themselves, whereby you have a government that's unwilling to um, sort of hold to the agreement as it's been negotiated or, you know, who wants to renegotiate that agreement, mm -hmm. um, which I don't think is out of the realm of possibility. For the time being, that seems to to sort of uh, be a distant possibility, but that could always come up again. Um, or if just, you know, the EU returns to it, I think is part of the regular institutional bargaining process because, you know, it is, it is an ongoing issue, which is how does the EU, you know, regulate uh, financial markets? Uh, what mm -hmm. is the EU's role within that? and sort of um, coming in and preventing uh, certain types of financial collapse uh, is what we've witnessed, uh, both in private sector and in the public sector. Um, so, I mean, is this going to be, to your mind, is this going to be revisited primarily in terms of, uh, you know, Greece specifically, where uh, the question is, can they hold to these agreements? Or are, are we going to see this replicated in other parts of the EU, right? The question has always been uh, uh, Iberia and potentially Italy, which would potentially have, you know, considerably larger effects on the, on the survival of the EU as a whole. Right. I think Italy it would be another question altogether. I mean, I suspect that the same sort of story would play out, but you know that that's far, probably far less certain because mm -hmm. of Italy's size and its importance. Um, in, in terms of Greece, I think the question of uh, where the EU institutions would come down, and particularly the member states, you know, uh, Germany and, and, and the rest, I think that that has been settled. I think that what we saw last summer was a showdown. Uh, which the Greek government sort of was was um, calling the EU out um, and thought that, uh, if they pushed it to the brink where it looked like Greece was going to default, that ultimately the EU institutions and the, and the larger member state governments would cave because they would fear the sort of repercussions. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, the, the leaders in Greece were saying this. They were out there, you know, stating quite publicly as part of the referendum that they had had, had planned that the EU is not going to let us leave. This is all sort of, you know, meant to distract from the issue. They, don't, they, they will not run the risk of the damage to the euro as a currency or their own economies. Uh, and I think that the leaders in Europe had decided that that was well worth the risk. I think some of them decided that, that the rest of the eurozone and the rest of the EU may in fact be better off, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that was only realized on the Greek side at the last minute. And that's why even after that referendum, ultimately the government caved to most of the concessions uh, and made the concessions that the EU had been demanding. Uh, and that's why then that triggered new elections ultimately, right? But right. I think if this were to replay itself, that the EU is not going, the EU has demonstrated that it's, it's basically willing to let Greece leave. Right, right. And right. sort of, and play that out and see what happens. The question is then, you know, what happens on the Greek side in terms of this sort of evolving politics there? And that really does bring in, you know, that theme that you're mentioning, the legitimacy, because mm -hmm. I think increasingly people are going to question the legitimacy of the EU itself. People, 
in Greece and outside of Greece. And so I let's, think, can know, I pause there? So, um, and, and I did. I am a, a sort of interested in this. But how? And, and you follow public opinion, uh, and you follow sort of you know attitudes towards this crisis. Uh, how, how would you characterize sort of the broad swaths, the broad the broad um, brushes of public opinion over the Greek crisis in the European Union? Right. I mean, we have some sense of what the Germans thought and of what you know people in some of the other countries thought. Um, but how has you know both the crisis itself and the resolution of the crisis, or at least the short term resolution of the crisis played out in public opinion terms in Europe? Or what do we know about this question so far? Well, I think there's actually a really interesting thing to that I just discovered last week. So the Eurobarometer is basically the standard survey that's offered at least sometimes more. by the, it's, it's funded and managed by the European Commission. And it's the public opinion poll. It's not the only one that's used, certainly by scholars of, of European public opinion, but it's one of the main ones. Mm-hmm. Um, and it has a question uh, that essentially is, do you think your country's membership in the European Union is a good thing or a bad thing? It's not the best question, but it's a question that's oftentimes used in the research because it's it's a question that has been included in almost every Eurobarometer survey, you know, stretching mm-hmm. back to the, the, the early 1980s when it, when it began. Um, and... I have this longitudinal data set that gathers questions from the Eurobarometer over time to look at over time comparisons and was updating it because I updated as new surveys become available and discovered that the they stopped asking that question, which is kind of a big deal because uh, oh, in terms of the scholars that, that study public opinion, that is, I mean, again, there have been a lot of critiques of it, rightfully so, and people have explored alternatives, but that's the same, that's the question that, that reoccurs in the research. And, you know, for the purposes of the commission, that's the way it can gauge public opinion. And that's the question that has been there in survey after survey. And now I think it was about 2011, they stopped asking it. Um, and so I sort of ran looking at uh, where, because I'll say the answers to that have remained fairly consistent, mm-hmm. even as sort of media portrayal and sometimes even scholarly portrayals of public opinion um, take on a more skeptical tone. The fact of the matter is, is that roughly a majority, between 50 to 60 percent have said a good thing. Maybe around you know twenty percent to thirty percent have said neither good nor bad. They're they're somewhat ambivalent on it, and it's really only fifteen percent of survey respondents that have said it was a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the the last couple of years that they asked the question, in other words, the first couple of years after the crisis began in 2010, 2011, there was a significant uptick in the bad thing. So I don't know why. Right. They pulled so, that question. I think it was significant, but it speaks uh-huh. to what may be going on with public opinion there. Oh, that's interesting. That that's interesting. I mean, you know, it, 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 is it possible that the stat is being collected but not being released in the traditional forms that it, it had been released before? That so that that, that it's still out there, or at least for um, the commission itself to use, or at least to have a handle on? Or do you think that they're simply no longer gathering? I think they're not gathering it. I mean, they are mm-hmm. still asking the question. Incident, inst- interestingly enough, in non-EU states, mm-hmm. um, they they always will split it and they'll ask, and then in you know, candidate states or other countries that are included in the survey. And so they are still asking it in non-candidate states, and that's mm-hmm. quite clear in the questionnaires. They, the, the commission does embargo data. So these most recent ones I've added, are, are you know, there's data embargoed from them. But there's there's no sign that that question was somehow included and data was gathered on it. It just simply hasn't been released. Mm-hmm. Now, that doesn't, I guess, preclude that they've done it in secret somehow. But I, I would doubt that's the case. I think they've stopped asking it for, for whatever reason. Right. Um now, how much regional variation is there in uh, sort of the responses to this question? You said you know, bare majority, you know, 25% doesn't care, and a smaller opposition. What do we get in terms of the regions? What does it look yeah, like regionally? I mean, there's always been more skepticism in Eastern Europe, I think, uh, or by always, I should say, really over the last 10 years. I think mm-hmm. there was something of a, a honeymoon period um, that was brief, and that the, the East European public has been more skeptical than the West in general. The British are, are obviously... Um, you know, usually far more skeptical. And then you see some pockets of it in some places in the South. You know, in Greece, it had declined, mm-hmm. uh, which isn't right. that surprising, I think, going, uh, considering what's going on there. Um, right. Yeah, so there, there's regional variation. But it's, you know, it's not honestly all that much. I mean, I think we're still talking about, you know, for the most part, most countries, you know, less than 20% will say it's a bad thing, or that used to be the case anyway. Right. So uh, you know, one way to summarize, to get back to... Um, the uh, question that I asked a little bit while ago is that it is not yet clear from the tools we have. It is not yet obvious that the current crisis has, um, or especially the, so the Greek situation, has in some sense fatally undermined uh, confidence in the European Union. Right, and I would say that that's. And I know it, fatally undermined is is adding an adjective there that's that's problematic, but. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think that 
that it has fatally undermined it yet. I think uh, skepticism has increased and it's probably increased beyond anything we've seen as, as we've been tracking this, Mm -hmm. you know, over time, that doesn't mean it's not going to to go down. I mean, even in, in, in the United Kingdom, you know, and this, this is something I hope we get a chance to talk about a a little bit more, but I saw a survey that came out yesterday in terms of the potential referendum on leaving. And it's, it's now something like, um, at least in the most this most recent survey that came out, over fifty percent of the British public have said that they'd like to stay in, and it's only around thirty to thirty five percent that said that they'd vote to leave. And that's that's you know different, I think, than you know six months or a year ago, where it was right. almost even in some polls that had been coming out. So, right. so yeah, and, uh, so we can definitely return to the uh, United Kingdom in a bit. But uh, for right now, I want to move on to the second the, the crisis that pushed the previous crisis off the uh, headlines, at least in the United States, which is the immigration crisis. So. Um, can you provide just a you know a little bit of a framework of of why this is such why this is a crisis for the institution rather than simply for the states that are facing Syrian immigration right now? So why why is this an EU problem um, beyond an Austrian, Hungarian, a German problem? Well, I think actually the the ways in which it's an EU problem really relate to the ways in which it's a problem overall because mm-hmm. I think the crisis um, has sort of two two aspects to it, and the one in which it's an institutional problem is that they have uh, they don't have the institutional framework in place. They don't have the agreement. In fact, they have the opposite um, to to sort of allow for burden sharing mm-hmm. when it comes to this. So they they all signed up under this this. It's called the Dublin Agreement, you know, um, that was made some time ago. And and the different countries of the EU agreed to basically a system where um, whatever uh, country uh, an asylum seeker sort of ends up at, uh, mm-hmm. where they first seek asylum, that's the country that bears responsibility for processing the application, for receiving the application and processing mm-hmm. it and making the decision and ultimately based on that decision, more or less accommodating that individual. Mm-hmm. And so that has made it the burden of all of the border states, right? right? Uh, and this this is another ongoing crisis. It's been sparked, you know, in the last month or so by what's been going on with the massive influx uh, um, of, of asylum seekers coming up. Uh, primarily from Syria, but from other countries as well. But it's been ongoing right, for I mean, years. Libya, it's, it's been, yeah, I mean, the, the Libya situation was also uh, a spur to, especially in the Mediterranean. Right. It's just primarily been focused on Spain and mostly Italy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's been partly regarded as a humanitarian crisis because to try and cope with the uh, massive influx of people coming up in Northern Africa, those two countries, and especially Italy, have created these detention centers on these islands where they're holding these asylum seekers while they're waiting for their applications to be processed. And of course, the, the conditions there aren't that great. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're, and in, so this this is you know this has been an issue for some time, and it, it has really uh, sparked most recently because there's now an even greater flow of these asylum seekers, and they're they're not coming up by sea, you know, which I think um, it's sort of that's a that's a dangerous route. Um, mm-hmm. And 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 so many people are now risking uh, everything, you know, all of the dangers that come along with basically uh, going up through Syria. Or if we're talking about Syrians, of course, they're leaving Syria and going up through Turkey and and, and trying to migrate to mainland Europe uh, via land. And that's mm-hmm. that's how Hungary has really been brought into the crisis then. Right. Because right. it was never really a part of this discussion before. And it's only now when you have these people coming up via land that it's been brought into that discussion. Right. Um, so. I guess two ways. Two ways in which. Uh, so you first. So I mean, what are we looking at then in terms of a um, an institutional response? Right. Is there what is the thinking about how the institutions respond? Or is basically everything being resolved now uh, intergovernmentally? Um, or I mean, is there a framework? Or is it is it going to be Germany relating with Hungary and so forth? You know, Germany trying to solve Hungary's problems in some fashion. You know, it how, is. How it, is it? How is it proceeding? It has to be a European response because. Uh, immigration and asylum seeking falls uh, under the EU's jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, when there was still the pillar system, and the pillars were ways to sort of distinguish between different types of policy areas and really, in some ways, distinguish some pillars as being intergovernmental, meaning that you had to more or less have unanimity be- versus the supranational ones where you didn't necessarily have to have that. Mm-hmm. Even back when we had the pillar system, and that was eliminated by the Treaty of Lisbon, um, immigration what fell under year, What one. was the year on that for, for our listeners? Who? Uh, 2007. Okay. Um, so immigration fell under pillar one and 
you know, a lot of the proposals that were advanced, and most of them really concerned putting in place a common system for receiving applications uh, from asylum seekers, uh, common criteria for making decisions on those, mm -hmm. a common database, you know, so that the different, primarily the border states, but all of the EU countries could share information with one another, but really rules governing that, you know, the, the EU didn't dictate how many people a member state had to accept. That was never part of this discussion, but the sort of procedures and processes by which migrants were admitted into countries and granted mm -hmm. visas, and especially which asylum seekers were admitted, that was all more or less harmonized at the European level and falls under the EU treaties. Um, and so, you know, a, a major part, I think, of resolving this crisis is ultimately going to be intergovernmental. I think that, you know, some of the um, actions and statements by uh, Chancellor Merkel, for instance, even, you know, this address that she just gave to the European Parliament mm -hmm. together um, with uh, President Hollande, uh, is going to be significant, but it does fall within the EU's uh, sort of legal infrastructure um, that exists right now. Mm -hmm. um, I think what they've already negotiated amongst the heads of government is to more or less have burden sharing for the problem as it exists right now. So mm -hmm. they're going to, you know, admit something like, I think, around 120,000 of these asylum seekers, and they're going to more or less proportionally distribute them across the member states based on the size of the countries. But that's a temporary solution. They have not negotiated a long-term fix. And like I said, mm -hmm. the agreement that was already reached was more or less that there's no burden sharing. And so they've got this temporary situation. So the, 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 the de facto, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the, the oh, what's the word? Their baseline is no burden sharing. And so what we're negotiating here is burden sharing. Right. Um, but, you know, Merkel signaled that the Dublin, uh, you know, agreement um, is, is untenable, that they have to replace it uh, just yesterday in the, in the address. Over to the parliament, um, and I think you know we we we're, we're seeing movement toward probably negotiating a permanent burden sharing agreement between the member states of the EU. Right. Um, so how is this? And I, I and uh, legitimacy legitimacy crisis is part of, of I think a part of all of these conversations we're having. How is does this right? Because when we are talking about the Syrian refugees, but also the Eritrean and also uh, the Libyan and so forth. Um, the, the, the reaction to these refugees within Europe has not been neutral, right? Um, right, that the, these uh, refugees have a particular uh, cultural impact on Europe that has had a, especially an effect on, on right-wing parties in Europe, right? That there's this concern, about, especially about the influence of Islam within Europe. Um, I mean, how is this interacting with, you know, broader concerns about EU legitimacy, right? That, that you're, you're bringing in this large... Um, population that may then trigger cultural shifts within the within the uh, within the continent. Um, it's it's hard to, to say for certain right now. I think I'm I'm more and more of the mind that basically uh, the EU and many of these European countries are going to parallel the U.S. Where I think that there's a very uh, vocal, um, relatively sizable pocket of the public that mm -hmm. sort of opposes letting anyone in mm -hmm. um, for many reasons uh, for anxiety over the potential economic consequences, the perception that they're taking jobs um, for cultural reasons. And I think that this may actually be more salient in Europe. I don't think that the cultural fears exist as much here in the United States In Europe, you know, as you've said, there are a lot of fears that migrants are going to diminish uh, what it means to be European and probably much more what it means to be French or German or Dutch or British, you mm -hmm. know, um, and so, and and that that's a fear that a lot of these these far right um, political elites have played on and mobilized. In fact, I would say that they probably try and capitalize on the cultural fear more than the economic one. Mm -hmm. um, some of the research in this area, in fact, suggests that research that's looking both at Euroscepticism or skepticism of the EU as well as opposition to immigration suggests that. Um, the, the foundation for any anxiety toward immigration tends to be economic in nature unless there are political elites that are capitalizing mm -hmm. on it. Right, um, right. And that's also true of the EU more generally. But I do think, it, you know, speaking to the legitimacy issue with the EU does ultimately get tied into that. Mm -hmm. um, and not even so much because the EU has jurisdiction here under the treaties to govern when it comes to immigration asylum seeking, but that this sort of idea of an external threat, you know, oftentimes gets lumped together with the European in union. And so oftentimes fear and anxiety over globalization in general, I think, gets grouped together with opposition to the EU. Um, and I think we, we see that uh, with, with uh, anti-immigrant um, um, sentiments that exist throughout Europe. 
Um, so then, uh, tacking over to our third crisis, and the third crisis that, um, at least in, a, in our pre-conversation conversation, you suggested was, um, <clears throat> I don't know whether we want to call it the return of Russia, right? but, the, but the, the looming issue of Russia's influence in Europe, and especially um, given uh, Russia's recent actions in Ukraine and potentially even in Syria, um, where we have, uh, you know, really, I mean, it's, you know, the annexation of Crimea and the establishment of pro-Russian um, governments in parts of Ukraine. Um, I guess, how would you then, would you characterize this primarily as a foreign policy crisis for the legitimacy of the EU as an institution, or is it more sort of a broader, um, as a, a broader uh, foreign policy crisis for the institutions that manage Europe, so not just the EU, but also NATO? I mean, what exactly, what, ex what, what threat does Russia pose? How is, I mean, even that is sort of, is, uh, I don't really like that language, but um, what problems are is Russia creating for the institutions of European unity at the moment? Um, I don't think it has uh, in the recent past in that I think that for the most part, the EU countries were fairly united in the response after mm -hmm. Russia's actions in the Ukraine. And, and of course, the EU was, I think, far more um, sort of interested in involved not interested in what's going on in Syria, and particularly mm -hmm. with the migration crisis, they very much are. But the U, they, they were more at the center of that conflict within the Ukraine, I think, because, I, I mean, the, the actions that, that prompted what was going on there were, were the sort of protests that took right. place in the Ukraine over the proposed uh, agreement with the EU. Right. Um, and then, of course, when that Dutch airliner was shot down in eastern Ukraine, that, I think, really mobilized a lot of support and unity within Europe in, in terms of a response to the Russians. Now, a lot of in a lot of ways, I think that crisis has been somewhat put on the, the back burner, mm -hmm. you know, still ongoing, right? Um, but but well, there's some know, indication. Some people are some people are suggesting actually that that the, the Russian government itself is very interested in backburnering this, right? Backburnering even the separatist sentiment, backing off uh, support for the separatists in eastern Ukraine and so forth. That's right. And you know what's interesting is I think that the Russians have uh, sort of in the intervening time really tried to take advantage of opportunities to build diplomatic connections within Europe, you know, where they presented themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Cyprus was was a candidate for that and one that Russia's taken full advantage of because, you know, there was a lot of Russian money invested in Cyprus and there were already some connections there. And so, you know, the Cyprus president has has uh, visited Russia and has, mm -hmm. has maintained sort of good relations with Putin. I think Italy has been one in which uh, Russia's continued to foster um, uh, or try to improve relations. And, and, and that has paid off to a certain extent. I mean, mm -hmm. Renzi, the prime minister of Italy, is coming out now and saying that um, basically the West needs to work with Russia in Syria right. um, uh, rather than sort of stand at odds with it or even act against it. And so, you know, whereas it had Russia had previously been sort of a unifying factor in the EU, I guess, and I don't know how much of a threat this is, but it does mm -hmm. pose some threat in terms of um, causing a sort of disunity uh, on foreign policy matters that has really been detrimental to the EU in the past, right? Mm -hmm. One one area where the EU institutions um, have themselves had difficulty bringing the member states together and where there's been difficulty facilitating cooperation has been in foreign and security policy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that the Europeans have really struggled with for 20 years now. It was something where um, a lot of observers sort of decided that they couldn't get their act together back in the 90s when it came uh, to addressing some of these crises in, in the Balkans and their back door, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then they tried to uh, mobilize the institutions, you know, improve the sort of mechanisms for cooperation that existed within the treaties um, and create new instruments to facilitate uh, cooperation, whether it's just in foreign policy or even in joint sort of military actions. Uh, and then the uh, Iraq war came in the early aughts, and that really divided Europe again. Right, right, right. The sort of consensus was that they'd been back and and so there's there's some potential for that now i think there's some potential between some uh, of some divide in europe when it comes to the response to russia um, i'm sorry you just froze in a particularly hilarious uh, pose right there that i'm gonna you know try to screen capture and share on facebook dozens of times but um all right <laughs> um so uh there are a few critics, um, I, I won't even say critics, but there are a few uh, analysts, commentators um, in the United States who have suggested something that's actually quite similar to, to what you just argued, that um, the consensus about Syria policy within Europe, and I, no, not consensus, but, but there are many within Europe and uh, the, Premier, the Prime Minister of Italy and so forth, um, who are, are beginning to come to this belief that, that Russia's 
um, approach to the Syrian crisis, which is fundamentally that, that the Assad regime or some sort of similar successor regime is the best chance for limiting ISIS, is the best chance for restoring stability in the region. Um, do you get the sense that that sentiment is becoming more <coughs> widespread, um, despite the fact that the British and the French and so forth are contributing in some fashion to the air campaign right now? You know, is, is Putin's case on this one that's hearing a lot of receptive ears? Um, I don't know about that. I think that there are some receptive ears mm -hmm. there. Um, and I can't honestly speak to whether it's spread or not. Um, you know, I think that there, that he, he has allies within Europe and those are relationships that he's built up over time. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think for the immediate, uh, time being, while, while there's, and it's an evolving situation and it could always spark further and, and become, you know, sort of more present, mm -hmm. uh, both in the media although obviously it is in the media now, but uh, within public discussions there. But I think right now uh, the Europeans have sort of put it a little bit on the back burner, and it's the migra migrant crisis that's that's really occupying attention. And it's right. NATO. I mean, to the extent that Europe is going to have a stronger voice in this, I think it's going to be through NATO rather than um, through through the EU. Um, right, and, NATO, and that's and partly because of Turkey, right? Because I think Turkey's assumed a much more prominent role in all this, and mm -hmm. NATO is going to be a far more appropriate institution with which uh, through which Turkey can help influence the situation. Um, right. So, right, and that's yeah. interesting. I mean, that's interesting because, for on, on the one hand, right, you have the United States, which has you know one of the more negative uh, views of Russia, and whatever there have you know certainly been conversations between Turkey and Turkey and Russia in recent years. But Turkey is resolutely opposed to the survival of the Assad regime, and Turkey is particularly uh, concerned with the uh, Russian uh, deployment of air power into Syria. So that's interesting that that Turkey will have an outsized voice in this. Well, within NATO, it'll be an insider's voice. Right. And, I th and I think, you know, obviously the U.S. has really, um, uh, in a lot of ways, prioritized the Turkish alliance, I think, over the last mm -hmm. couple of months, right? And so, you know, the U.S. already, in a lot of ways, has the lead in the situation, I think, because it's it's really been, um, in some ways, leading the response to the ongoing situation in Syria. But mm -hmm. um, it's probably going to prefer NATO for that regard, but also it's going to advocate um, for Turkey to have influence in that, and that's going to, you know, best be expressed through NATO. So... Um, and I think, I mean, while I do think that there are going to be pockets um, uh, within Europe that advocate um, for working with Putin, I can't say as to whether those pockets are going to grow larger or not, but they're going to exist. At the end of the day, they're going to come up against, at, at minimum, some of the larger Western powers like uh, Great Britain and France uh, and Germany, as well as many of the East European countries who are, right, are not going right. to come around on Putin at all. So it's... Right. Um, you know, the, the the most that can be reached is that there won't be unanimity within the EU about how to respond to Russia, um, particularly if it's not in the Ukraine, you know, particularly if it's somewhat removed. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to move on now to uh, what I wanted to characterize as another crisis, but you weren't sure it was actually a crisis at all. And um, in particular, I wanted to talk about the, the, the emerging situation in Hungary, which, uh, you know, a lot of, at least on the journalistic side, people have suggested that what, what you are having, what you're seeing now in Hungary is the emergence of, a, of an illiberal regime within the broader liberal uh, EU framework. Um, and I know some people have argued that this you know, represents another one of these crises of legitimacy where the EU can't even um, sort of, which has, has, you know, one of the selling points for the EU has long been that it establishes democratic norms on, on its eastern front and causes states to become more democratic as um, they, they come to uh, uh, fulfill the requirements of EU membership. But in this case, it, it appears that you have a state which is becoming less democratic within the current structure of the EU. Um, and I guess, what, you know, what are your thoughts on, on that, whether this is a crisis or why it isn't, or it's something that's back burnerable, or, or what's going on with, with Hungary? It really sets me up to say that I don't think it's a crisis. It's like I'm, I'm slitting the throats of bunnies right here. Um, I just can't see it. Uh, are, are you going to do that on camera? Because that'd be a blogging heads first. Uh, if I only had one uh, and knew the proper technique. But um, I, it's not that I don't think it's a crisis. It's that I think it's at this point in time part of a larger crisis that's really related to the, the EU. Mm -hmm. um, because I think part of what is spurring these trends within Hungary and to a lesser extent in some other countries is something of a popular reaction mm -hmm. against these same sort of forces we've been talking about, the European Union, globalization, uh, to a lesser extent immigration, although that's that's become larger in Hungary now, right? Mm -hmm. um, right. I, I, you know, it's, it, I think it's it's not new, again. I think that there have been these 
illiberal tendencies that have existed in some Eastern European countries uh, since membership. I mean, I think if you look at Romania and Bulgaria, right, it's mm-hmm. hard to to argue that these are fully functioning liberal democracies. I guess the point might be that Hungary is taking a step back and and it's OK to have some li- illiberal elements within certain governments so long as they're moving forward. Mm-hmm. Um, honestly, that doesn't I mean, that doesn't make the Copenhagen criteria are the ones that say to be members of the EU, you have to satisfy certain political, economic uh, and judicial criteria. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, if, if if those hold and we're loyal to those and, and we uphold them all, you know, at all fronts, it shouldn't matter if someone's violating them already. But they're they're gradually getting better or someone's doing all right by those criteria. But they're, they're gradually getting worse. Right. right? right, right. Um, you know, I, I think that it is a crisis and I'm worried about it. Um, and not just in Hungary and that we 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 have an increasingly um, skeptical public uh, within Europe, you know, who who is increasingly veering more to the right. Um and 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 when you have something of a, a shift in the center, right, mm-hmm. um, and you have something of a consolidation on the extreme right, you know, in some places maybe around twenty to thirty percent, mm-hmm. that that is going to allow for the rise of and, and, and give a sort of bullhorn to certain voices that are kind of disturbing, mm-hmm. uh, and in some cases certain policies that that really. Uh, fall against the eu but again i don't think it's so much like this crisis that hungary is becoming an illiberal state is it's it's a sort of you know increasing it is a manifestation of a broader series of of trends that may be problematic in and of themselves right yeah um we hadn't talked about this before although you mentioned it a little bit with respect to uh, attitudes towards the eu within uh, great britain um to what extent uh, are uh, situations like uh, we have in um, the separatist ambitions of uh, the Catalans, the separatist ambitions in Scotland, to, w- to what extent are these going to, um, is there a potential for these to trigger? Uh, and this is, you know, this is different than right-wing sentiment. This is, this is something that, is, if anything, maybe even a little bit more left-wing in terms of um, you know, one of the logics behind Scottish uh, separatism is not simply um, it's 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 resistance to you know the neoliberal consensus of London or whatever you want to call it. Um, how, I guess, from your sense, how was were the EU institutions and the EU more broadly preparing to react to the potential and you know the continuing potential for separatism in Scotland and separatism in parts of Spain? I think the institutions were solidly behind uh, Scotland's remaining part of the, the, of the United Kingdom and, and mm-hmm. are opposed to any sort of separatist movement within Spain. Mm-hmm. Um, so much so that I don't think they'll completely close the door on the possibility that those regions could become members. But they've you know, been very clear that, that you know, were Scotland a separator or Catalan a separator, or if you had a region become its own state, it wouldn't mm-hmm. be guaranteed EU membership. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. It wouldn't begin as an EU member, and it wouldn't have access to the, to European markets or have all of the advantages of EU membership, mm-hmm. um, because that was something that was, I think, being uh, flouted as part of some of these separatist movements. That w- you know, the assumption that those countries would separate and sort of just be members of the EU, you know, right. derive all the benefits that come from that. It's interesting. I've 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 oftentimes heard and thought myself that sort of uh, regional. Um, governments um, and and regional ties sort of correspond with supranational ones, mm-hmm. right? This sort of working idea that the nation state is itself being attacked at levels and is having sovereignty and power diminished at both levels. And to the extent that that's going on, oftentimes regional aspirations have sort of gone parallel or hand in hand with supranational European aspirations, right? And right. you've seen right. the EU aid regional governments. There's a committee of regions that has an institutional role within the EU decision-making process. Mm-hmm. The EU gives funds specifically to regions for regional development, and that does sometimes take the form of supporting political development within the regions. And so, you know, I had this um, a paper that's that's now out, out uh, that be, but that began as something completely different with a co-author of mine that focused specifically on the UK and on Scotland, and mm-hmm. was looking at sort of identity and how that was tied into the whole movement. And the sort of speculation was that strong regional identifiers within Scotland and st- strong proponents of, of separation would also actually identify with the EU, right? Because, mm-hmm. they, you know, the, the working assumption, again, was that they were aspiring for EU membership and it wasn't really the EU they had problems with. It was London. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that you might have had regional identity and sort of European identity 
reinforcing one another sort of against this this British identity. And the survey didn't, didn't bear that out. You know, most of the strong regional identifiers in Scotland were as skeptical or more so of the European Union as they were, yeah, yeah. yeah of, the, of the British government. So, um, you know, that's, that's not to say that Scotland wouldn't want membership in the EU. I think it absolutely would, you know, but uh, Nick, I need I'm you not to... sure that, like, Yes. I need you to stop creeping to your right because you're actually getting really, your head is now getting, there we go. Perfect. Sorry about that. Oh, well, that's no problem. Um, anyway, continue, continue. Uh, Rob oftentimes has to warn me against creeping. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, but so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't, you know, that's, that sort of um, data was not conclusive enough that I'd ever mm -hmm. say, oh, well, you know, regional sentiments and support for regional governance, you know, it, 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 you know, goes hand in hand with skepticism of the EU as well. But we, mm -hmm. we, that's sort of what we found in that one sort of snapshot, that one paper, right? And right. Um, and we were expecting to find the opposite, which is why the paper sort of shifted direction. Oh, that's really interesting. Oh, yeah, we really interested. And now, is there any data about uh, about Catalonia, right? About the similar attitudes there? Because that's one where you can at least envision. I mean, I guess maybe it's part of the reason that it's easier to envision a, a Scotland that's not part of the EU is because it's kind of all the way up there, and you you, know, you can. But Catalonia, that would be really hard to have a non-EU part just right there in the middle of Europe. Oh, it would make Schengen more difficult, right? right. Cause, um, but, um, I, you know, I, I, our, that study that I mentioned, that we, we didn't have data mm -hmm. on that, and, and I haven't seen any. You know, I think, again, it's, they are slightly different situations. Right, I right, think right. that relative to the rest of the national economy, Catalonia is, is, is much better probably than what Scotland was. That's not mm -hmm. to say that Scotland's doing poorly, but I mean, the part of the problem with Scotland too, was that it assumed it was going to continue to sort of possess access to certain oil reserves off the coast that I don't think would have been a settled question. And that right. would have been very essential towards Scotland maintaining any sort of economic leverage. Right. right. Um, whereas that, that is a very different situation. Catalonia is, is really in some ways propping parts of Spain up, right. It's, it's like an economic engine there. And so, um, it, it's probably a, a region or a territory that could break off on its own uh, and and manage much better. And because of that, probably would stand a much better chance of actually getting in the EU or getting in sooner. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but in terms of the the public sentiments there and whether that parallels what we saw in Scotland, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So. I, uh I want to end this by um, by shifting towards more of a, a um, in a more academic quest, d direction and in a more sort of almost sociology of knowledge. Um, uh, now you are you are an EU scholar. Fundamentally, that's what you are. Right, you study international institutions, but the EU is what you do. Um, which is, and you're part of this broad community within political science, but also with relations to other um, disciplines that studies uh, the EU. Um, has is there any degree of, from your point of view, is there any existential angst within your community of the sort that, you know, during the 1990s we found among Soviet specialists, during the late 1990s we found among security specialists uh, within the field of political science, which is that this big thing that we're studying may cease to exist. Um, and that was sort of weird that security specialists had that, but security specialists really did have this angst in the 1990s, this big thing war that we study is going to stop existing, which, and you know, thank God that didn't happen. But um, is there any sort of similar angst in your, in your community? Is there anybody out there saying, what do we do if, if the EU collapses? Um, well, let me tell you about my research on Australia. That, <laughs> <laughs> um, Austria to Australia was very similar. Was very similar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, although I don't know if that angst existed before the collapse of the Soviet Union, you know. Right, um, that's true. Um, I, I think that the idea of it going away is probably uh, unimaginable to most people. Mm -hmm. um, and whether, uh, and I would throw myself in that category, and whether we are all fools or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that there's not retrenchment, you know. It's, it's not even... I mean, I think actually, I think this probably is kind of unimaginable, but mm -hmm. probably has become more possible over the last few years that if the Eurozone weren't to go away, that there would be some retrenchment in it. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. we've never had anyone leave it or the EU. Mm -hmm. Right. And we really came to the brink of, of Greece leaving the last summer. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's not unimaginable that it could still happen. Of course, it's possible that the United Kingdom could leave the EU uh, uh, 
more broadly. But it's an organization that I think has over the last 15 years developed me- mechanisms to allow for that sort of um, right. uh, such things to happen. I mean, it now the treaties do now allow for the country to leave. Um, and more and more, the treaties have incorporated language and mechanisms that allow for sort of what we call differentiated integration, where if the British don't want to move ahead and integrating one policy area, the sort of rest of Europe can do it. If there's not support to do it amongst the whole, then you can have pockets that move ahead in terms of cooperation or integration. And that sort of flexibility in terms of those mechanisms, I think, would allow possibly for the EU to cope if anything catastrophic, such as a British exit or a Greek mm-hmm. exit, were to occur. But more to the point, I mean, even if, if we saw a decline in the Eurozone, that doesn't mean the single market's going anywhere. Right, right, right. I don't think there's any interest for that, right? Other than maybe extremist pockets. I mean, it, you know, every free trade is still the sort of norm everywhere. We're, we're about to conclude here in the U.S. this free trade agreement with the Pacific countries. TTIP, which is a similar agreement that's been negotiated with the EU, is still ongoing. Um, right. You know, I, I, I don't think that the countries and governments and even the peoples of Europe, even if they're skeptical of, of parts of the EU and want to see things very differently, want to see the single market go anywhere. And the single market's where it began. And that's really the core of what it is. It's all of what it was for most of its existence from mm-hmm. the 50s, really up through the early 90s. Uh, and the, at the point where there's still that single market, that I think that the EU will still be there. Um, and so even if it were to change somehow due to these political circumstances, there would be still something to study. Right, um, there, right. there, there would be a purpose for EU uh, scholars, at least so much as there's a purpose for us now. <laughs> right, right, right. Or for any of us. Right. All right. Well, um, you know, Nick, this has been a fantastic conversation, and uh, hopefully, uh, our listening public, uh, which all 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 four of you out there, um, is now going to feel you know considerably more enlightened. Steve, Bill, you know, Dion, uh, um, uh, going to feel more enlightened about EU issues. And so, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you. It's fun.